Well, uncertainty remains around the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. An emergency meeting at the CDC yesterday to discuss the single dose shot ended without a decision on when the vaccine can be given out again. The panel is investigating six cases of women who developed a rare blood clotting disorder after getting the shot. One of those women died. Another was left in critical condition. Inaction by the panel likely extends the pause on the Johnson & Johnson shot for at least another week. So for more on this, we want to bring in Justin Gill. He's an urgent care nurse practitioner and a health policy lecturer at the University of Washington, Washington Bothell. Thank you so much for joining us. So Justin, with the continuance uh, on the stop of the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the pause, um, many may wonder about the vaccines um, resources, just, you know, the availability of vaccines in general, because now it means at least one of the options is off the table. Um, just how concerned should people be? Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think that's a fabulous question. I, you know, when we look at the vaccine mm -hmm. supply, we want every available vaccine to be out there and administered to patients. Uh, thankfully, the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine makes up a very small percentage of the shots that were actually given. Um, and we still have two very good vaccines. And more recently, it was announced that their supply would increase for both Pfizer and Moderna. That's very reassuring. I think that, you know, we are lucky to have two other vaccines um, that are very high quality and are not currently under this pause. Uh, so that uh, certainly makes me a little bit more optimistic that we still can administer vaccines at a fast pace uh, to be able to eventually reach herd immunity. So as you know, Moderna has announced its plans to have a COVID booster shot for its vaccine ready by the fall. Help us understand what the booster shot is and why it's a priority for Moderna. Yes, uh, the booster shot is one of those that has been talked about over the past few months uh, for both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, particularly because one, we don't necessarily know how long the immune response will last to both of those vaccines. The only way you can tell is by following those patients from the clinical trials and assessing to see whether they have an antibody response or additional immune responses. I think that the booster shot also provides an opportunity for us to provide better coverage of some of the variants that we've noticed from South Africa, the United Kingdom, Brazil. Um, all of those have some suspicion of being able to evade protection that's provided from the vaccines. This is something that we've known. I think that this is a good step to stay ahead of it uh, before those uh, booster shots are absolutely needed. Uh, and uh, it's something that I'm definitely looking forward to. I want to just take us back to the J&J &J shot and because there's a sort of one component of the question that I kind of skipped over and it had to do with symptoms. We know, you know, there's only six people who have been impacted in this way that, that we're aware of. That's a minute amount compared to the millions of people who've already received this vaccine. Still, it's a serious, you know, health complication. So can you just kind of walk us through if you got the vaccine, if you are concerned, should you get a checkup? What sort of symptoms should you be looking out for? That's a great question as well, and, and probably on the minds of, of many folks uh, that have received the vaccine. For the most part, your likelihood of getting this is extremely rare. In the general population, the incidence of cerebral sinus of venous thrombosis is one in one million. We know that with these six participants, they did get it about two to three weeks after getting their Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The symptoms actually can be very vague and sometimes difficult to distinguish from some common side effects that you would get from the vaccine, such as body aches, chills, fatigue, mild headache. If you do start developing severe headache, abdominal pains, leg pains, shortness of breath, something that really seems out of proportion with what you'd ordinarily expect uh, with mild side effects, have a low threshold to be evaluated. If you walked into my urgent care that I'm at, We'll take great care of you and we would be able to distinguish whether these were symptoms from the side effects of the vaccine or if it's something that needed a higher level of care um, and immediate evaluation in, say, an emergency department or a facility that has the ability to do imaging and rapid blood tests. So when somebody gets vaccinated, they still face the chance of being infected with COVID-19. Uh, I've heard it called a breakthrough infection. Explain what this potential scenario looks like and what we're learning about it. Yeah, so breakthrough infections is something that uh, we all kind of were expecting at some point. The COVID-19 vaccine, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and some of the other ones that are out there, 
they do not provide 100% protection. That was known during the clinical trials, and that's something that we're starting to see uh, at this time as well. The numbers are frankly not super surprising to, to most of us uh, that are taking care of patients. We do know that some do still get infected and test positive for COVID-19, but there's still a lot of unknowns about those individuals that do end up testing positive. For example, are they infected with one of the COVID-19 uh, variants that there's some suspicion that they may evade the vaccine protection? Are they, um, what is their viral load shedding? What is, um, you know, did, who did they get it from and what was the um, amount of viral load that they were exposed to? The good news is, is that amongst a majority and, or many of these patients, they exhibited very mild symptoms and did not experience life-threatening or severe COVID-19 infection. Um, and in most cases did not require hospitalization. So in the end, it still provides great protection, but we know that some will still get the COVID-19 virus and it's essential that they still continue to follow those public health guidelines, wear a mask and remain vigilant when they're around other high-risk individuals. Really important information. Justin Gill, thank you as always, my friend. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you.